Good evening. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar, Super Tough Wildflowers with Ian Caton. I'm Ann DeNovo. I'll be your host. This is a very special program brought to us by our Western Mountains chapter. This would have been part of the Mountain um, Maryland Native Plant Festival at New Germany State Park which unfortunately was not able to be held this year. And we hope our speaker, Ian Caton, was a vendor for many years at the uh, Mountain Maryland Native Plant Festival. And we want to give special thanks to Liz McDowell, the coordinator of our Western Mountains chapter, for bringing us this program tonight, Ian Caton, and together with his wife, Elizabeth, they are the owners and operators of Wood Thrush Natives, Native Plant Nursery in Floyd, Virginia. And as I said, he's been a vendor at the Mountain Maryland um, Native Plant Festival for many years. He's been operating Wood Thrush Native since 2013, when he took it over from the previous owner who had been operating it since the early to mid 1990s. Wood Thrush is a nursery specializing in the native plants of the Appalachians, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Tennessee. And one of the focuses of Wood Thrush Natives is the introduction of new and rare native plants that are unknown or underappreciated in the nursery trade. Before um, taking over wood thrush natives, Ian was an employee of Larry Wiener Landscape Associates, a landscape firm specializing in the use and promotion of native plants and landscaping, and he was there since 2001. He has a degree in ornamental horticulture and environmental design from Delaware Valley College. He has an extensive knowledge of native plants and integrating them into um, the human environment. He has experience um, in a long running relationship with Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve and also many years of experience designing and installing native landscapes, including the opportunity to work with local governments on development of landscape plans for public spaces. He has had numerous speaking engagements at uh, various garden clubs, botanic gardens, and native plant uh, symposia and conferences. So we are lucky to have him. And with that, Ian, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for being here. All right. So, um, yeah, this uh, lecture kind of uh, derived from uh, many of my experiences that I had when I was doing uh, landscape design work. Uh, when I used to uh, uh, primarily be a landscape designer for Larry Wiener Landscape Associates. Um, and, you know, when I first graduated college and started working uh, in, in native plants, you know, I had, I was one of those people that, you know, had already this, this knowledge of all these interesting and unusual native plants. And I thought that, you know, I'd have finally have a chance to plant all these great things in people's yards. And you know trilliums and and uh, um, uh, all these little dainty floxes and wood enemies and things like that. And you know, in in uh, for many people, especially in difficult conditions, urban conditions, suburban conditions, they just weren't working. They just kind of languished there. And so as I was working in a lot of these less than ideal uh, landscapes, um, I started to work out the things that really did reliably work under many difficult conditions in the landscape trade. And it wasn't that I wouldn't make use of a trillium or a wood flocks or something like that. You know, they had their place, they had their point, uh, but they couldn't be the backbone of the design. 
They just weren't going to do the heavy lifting work of a sustainable, low maintenance landscape for people. Um, you know, so when I was dealing with uh, these projects in, in uh, this, this particular one is in Yonkers in New York City, you had situations where you had um, uh, urban heat island effects, you had bad scraped soil, um, hard pan, clay, uh, salt, uh, minerals and, and heavy metals in the soil. Um, you had uh, persnickety neighbors and zoning ordinances and, and all the things that come along, not to mention uh, all the other perils that, 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 that are out there uh, with deer, uh, no, with, with landscaping deer. Um, and uh, so, you know, I wanted to have a list of plants that in total kind of addressed more or less all of the major problems that come with landscaping in an urban or suburban yard or other places that are not quite um, a, a national forest. Um, deer, of course, uh, being one of uh, the, not everything is deer resistant. I mean, a lot of people throw out lists of deer resistant plants. And, you know, in my experience that there's not really any such thing as a deer uh, resistant plant. There are plants that they favor less than others. That is just one layer of dealing with deer in the landscape is, is choosing the plants that they don't favor too much. Um, other elements that, that people have tried and we've used in the past are all the various offs and reflective tapes and repellents and this and that's. And that's all well and good, but it also is just another layer of dealing with it. And it doesn't get to the source of the problem. It doesn't begin with the plants. Um, you know, you could use uh, various other expensive doodads like these sonic devices that uh, make them uncomfortable. And they made me uncomfortable when I was working at this project. Uh, if you were too close to one of these things, it made your stomach turn. Um, and of course, finally re uh, resorting to expensive and material intense fencing. You know, uh, all these things are, are part of a possible way of dealing with the deer problem. But the beginning of dealing with the deer problem before you even get into all these more intensive methods is to look at the plants themselves, but not just the plants, but how you use the plants. And a lot of it comes down to not just choosing the right plants, the less favored plants, but also planting them in a matrix. This is how these plants grow in the wild. Um, you know, they grow together tightly, all intermingled in a, in a collection that is um, um, mutually beneficial. And a landscape, now that this is a prairie landscape or a meadow landscape, just being used as an example, this isn't going to work in every case in terms of, uh, of uh, woodland or other application. I'm kind of using it as an extreme example here. Um, but the idea is that you've got grasses, you've got butterfly weed, you've got bee bombs, you've got all these different things. And some of them the deer like more and some of them the deer like less. And they're all scattered about in there in a somewhat organized but also disorganized manner. You know, there's layers to this landscape. It's like a bowl full of mixed vegetables and they can't eat the sweet carrots without getting some, some lima beans in there. You know, it's not the buffet that many people's gardens are. You don't put the plants and then have six inches of space and then another plant. That makes it really easy for them to come get the plants. Eat all they want of the stuff they like. Mix it up, mix it up, mix the good things, the things they, they like, the things they don't like. And they spend so much time picking around in there, it, it makes it harder for them to, to, uh, to just eat everything right down. Now, a matrix planting can be a little bit more um, subtle. You know, it could just be a matter of layering in things. Here we've got a layering of Chrysogonum virginianum with Amsonia rubricti, two plants that aren't super favored by deer but there's no openings, there's no gaps in this landscape, there's no room for anything else. It's still a dense, thick layering 
uh, landscape. And if they find something they do want to eat, they've got to go and hunt around for it. Um, here's another example of one. Here we've got butterfly weed, uh, aster uh, oblongifolius, the fragrant aster, and Calaroe uh, involucrata, the, the wine cups. Three plants that the deer don't wonderfully love, although they do like the wine cups uh, somewhat but they're all densely packed together. So again, they've got to work on this in order to get uh, the things that they want to eat. And you're not just layering things in physical space like this one is here. You're dealing with a specific point in time where everything is there all at once. Think about the things that aren't in the landscape at that time. Things that are only around at certain times of the year. Here's a uh, Virginia bluebells. Those are things that are in the spring. When they go dormant, other plants will come in and take their place. So that you're not only layering in physical space, you're layering these plants in time. You essentially have just doubled the number of plants in your garden by being able to pick plants that don't interfere with, with one another on a chronological level. Um, you're filling in those gaps. There's not empty space here in the springtime. There's not going to be empty space here in the summertime. Now, when you do layer these things together, there's a couple of things you have to be cognizant of. Use plants that layer well together. They have to be peers in the, in the ecology of, of where they come from. You can't necessarily just pick and choose willy-nilly the things you stick together and just cram them together and hope that they work. Um, here is Marshallia grandiflora with um, uh, uh, Anothera freticosa. Marshalli is a plant that comes from a low competition rock uh, based ecology. And Anothra freticosa, the sun drops there, is a meadow plant and it runs roughshod over everything. These two are the same size roughly, but they're not really compatible from a competition standpoint. It looks pretty right now, but those barber's buttons are going to get forced out. They cannot put up with the kind of competition that a plant like Anothra will bring. So you can't just look at the size of a plant to determine whether they work well together or whether they're both drought tolerant. You have to look at where they come from in the ecology and see how they layer in with one another. Here's an example of one that does work using a couple of pretty aggressive plants. River oats, Chasmanthium latifolium with uh, Aster macrophyllus or Eurybia macrophylla to use the new name. Um, which is the big leaf aster. These are two very aggressive plants. And if individually, they would run roughshod over weaker plants, but they work well together to lock this site up and make it dense and impenetrable to weeds. And while the deer would like to eat the asters, they don't really care for the chasmanthium. And so they have to work at it to eat those asters, they've got to work their way through that chasmanthium to get at them. You also have to look at how the thing, these things grow underground. If you're gonna put plants close to one another, you can't just also look at the way they grow above ground. You're not just looking at the way they grow in time. You're also looking at where their roots are underground. Shallow rooted plants mixing with deep rooted plants or tap rooted plants uh, with fibrous rooted plants. Um, these things work well together because they're not competing on the same level underground any more than they're competing for sunlight above ground. So you can put a taproooted plant like a, a Bacticia with a shallow rooted plant like a Coreopsis. You could put a deep rooted plant like one of our native uh, warm season grasses like big blue stem with a shallow rooted plant like bee balm or wild bergamot, the Menardas. And then when you apply that to the landscape, you've got to think about how this works in scale as well. Um, if you are buying up a bunch of uh, plants to stick in here, you're going to end up spending a lot of money on uh, plants if you try to buy the same size. Um, especially if you're looking at doing what I've just been mentioning, layering tons of plants in here that work over multiple time frames uh, and to fill this in. That's a lot of plant material. So you want plants that are gonna work the job for you. Um, your tap-rooted plants, your big 
uh, chunky plants. They're the ones that are going to you're going to spend the most money on. It's your shallow rooted spreading ground cover plants. They're in there. You can't see them, but if you uh, were to look closely, you'll see that there's actually little plugs all over in there, and that is actually the primary ground covers that are layering into this landscape. Um, they're the shallow rooted spreading plants that will fill this up and fill the space in between the deeper and more tap rooted plants in this landscape. So you don't have to buy or ex uh, everything doesn't have to be a big chunky plant, an expensive plant. Um, you buy things that are going to spread and give you lots of uh, free plants uh, over time. You know, that especially becomes a problem when you're dealing with really big sites, you know, not just the little, little sites. You've got to choose plants that are going to do the job for you. A lot of those plants that are going to do the job for you are the little low creepers. Again, you got to look at the root systems of these plants. People are afraid of these plants. You know, the, a lot of times people will ask me for native ground cover suggestions, but also they don't want anything aggressive. I don't, you know, a ground cover plant is kind of aggressive by definition. Again, that comes down to knowing how these plants work in the ecology, how they fit together, how they layer together in the wild. Stoloniferous plants are plants that have above ground uh, rooted, uh, above ground stems. They reach out and look for gaps and openings in the landscape. Uh, they are dependent on finding those gaps where they can root in in order to survive. If they don't find a gap, then that stolen will die off or else it will root temporarily and send out another one to keep looking for a better location. These plants will form the ground covers in the landscape, but they're also going to be your band-aid in the landscape. They're gonna fill up this space that opens up when the plant dies. They're gonna open up the space. Uh, they're gonna fill in the space that occurs whenever someone goes in there accidentally with a shovel and digs something out or when somebody uh, 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 drives through there and does donuts in an, in, in an ATV, you know, what's gonna fill that space in are these plants. And they come in all different sizes and you've gotta, again, gotta to the situation. You know, pussy toes and bluets, they're both little low stoloniferous plants. They're great for dry, uh, poor soils, even in dry, poor lawns. Um, in many cases, you might need something a little more robust, like the American wild strawberry, for example, um, an underrated ever semi-evergreen ground cover for full sun. Um, people often ask me for an evergreen ground cover for full sun, and I'll usually tell them that there isn't any such thing. But the closest thing that we do get often are things like the uh, semi-evergreen plants, like for Gary virginica a great space filling plant in, in a meadow planting. The other kind of root system that's really important is the rhizomatous plants. Now these are the plants that have underground stems. They're not reliant on photosynthesis for their survival. They're getting all of their nutrients from their parent and therefore they're able to punch their way into existing growth and force new growth into that space. This is the kind of plant you want if you're dealing in a weedy, difficult, old field, old woods. Um, if you have uh, places where you want things to come up, but there are already plants there, um, then you need these kinds of plants because they're the only ones that are going to be able to force their way in. Things like common milkweed, Chelone glaber, white turtle head for another example. Um, and then your deep rooted plants, your clump forming deep rooted plants. These are uh, the native warm season grasses that pictured here. This is actually, uh, I believe, a Budalua. Um, some of these plants can have root systems that go up to 20 feet deep. Uh, that's an incredible depth on a plant. It's deeper than many trees, in fact, in terms of, of total root depth. Uh, that means that they're completely not worried about drought they're not worried about nutrient deficiency. They're not worried about competition from other plants. These are the things that are, are often the, uh, uh, the big showy plants in the garden that the ground covers fill in around them. Uh, some common examples, of course, a broom, common broom sedge for, for a really common one, um, but also some of the flowering perennials that you might be familiar with, like Amsonia tabernae montana, the, uh, the blue star 
or Baptistias for that matter. Um, let's move along to some of the other difficult situations, poor soils and drought. The solution traditionally to poor soils and drought, particularly for drought and weed control, is uh, just pour some mulch all over it. And the trend over the last 20, 30 years has been more mulch and more mulch and then colored mulch to the point that you would think mulch is the only thing of attraction in a garden, that mulch is the main feature of a garden in some of these places. The one in the upper left-hand corner here appears to be a garden of uh, rock and mulch, and there appear to be some little green weeds coming up in it. You know, those might be plants, but who knows? Um, or that's used to the point where the mulch actually kills the plants that you're trying to grow in there. Mulch is very bad for a lot of plants, not just trees, uh, like in the little right-hand side here where it's rotted out the, the, the trunk of the tree, but many of our ground covers do not grow well with mulch. It is in that, in not something that occurs in the wild. There is no place that is like a, a, uh, a, a place that has a natural covering of wood chips, you know, to two or three or four inches deep. If you're trying to do a low maintenance, uh, low input native garden, you've got to really back off on the mulch. It should only be there for establishment. It's the plants that should be taking over and doing the job that the mulch is doing. It can be done wrong. Again, here's a case where they were moving in the right direction. Here we've got a ground cover where they planted sedges, a sedge grass ground cover that was intended to be in here, but they kept mulching it and mulching it and mulching it. Uh, and, and that mulch retarded the growth of the plants. The plant has been unable to move out into the landscape, take over, seed itself around. Mulch, of course, prevents seed germination. It has prevented these plants from achieving a solid ground cover because mulch has been continuously applied here. If the mulch were to have been backed off, then these sedges would fill in and you wouldn't have to mulch anymore. And it would look a lot better than it does currently. Right now, it basically looks like someone's lawn, patchy lawn that they've let go. Other improvements that, that are not necessarily, when using a lot of these plants, the deadheading, the dividing, the addition of composts and topsoils and sands and gypsums and whatever else that you're turning into your soil, most of this stuff is unnecessary and often even bad for native plants. M native plants exist on the edge of starvation in the wild. That is where they perform best. Adding compost only feeds weeds for the most part, which then makes people want to put down even more mulch. Back off on the compost, back off on the improvements of the soil, native plants don't need it. It's just more input into the, into the garden a sustainable native plant garden is supposed to have less intensiveness to it. It's supposed to have less input. So therefore you should choose the plants that fit to the soils on your site rather than modify the site to fit the kinds of plants you want to grow. That's the essence of, of uh, low maintenance landscaping. And then all this other stuff that goes along with it, water sprinklers that are frequently broken and end up as being defunct plastic trash. Um, sometimes we'll set up sprinklers temporarily, like in the lower left-hand corner, established through perhaps the first summertime. But more often than not, people over-irrigate, it rots the plants. And I can't tell you how often I've worked at a landscape where we've dug up or busted a, a a sprinkler that no one's even using anyway. So in my opinion, uh, this again can be entirely done away with, with choosing plants that work with the site, that fit the site, and that don't need any of this stuff. Here's a place in uh, the Catskill in New York. It's uh, a solid chunk of bedrock with about four inches of, of uh, topsoil not even topsoil, it's really subsoil that was scraped away. The house was built and then the, the house was built right onto the bedrock. And then this soil was kind of spread right on back onto it. It's just a handful of inches of, of old soil 
um, spread on top of a solid uh, dome of bedrock. In fact, uh, when it rains, uh, the bedrock prevents the water from infiltrating the uh, ground and it, it, it goes and gets uh, really wet. And then it's sometimes very dry. But that soil is completely unimproved. Uh, it's got rock in it, it's got grit in it, it has wet spots, it has all kinds of imperfections. And we didn't do anything to it uh, other than put some plants in it. And here it is just a few years later, just two or three years later, really. You note, no mulch. The mulch is only there at the beginning, immediately after planting. No irrigation system, no composts, no uh, sand. Nothing was done to this soil. No, no interventions were taken other than to add a walkway, the wall, and the plants. And choosing the plants carefully to fit the site. Here's another location, a different kind of a situation, full sun, hot, dry. This is the site of a former mansion that was demolished back in the 30s. And then this guy wanted to build a, a new house on it. Uh, and in fact, he wanted the garden to be done before the house was done so that when he moved in, he had a finished garden ready. Uh, and look at that soil, it's yellow. All it is is subsoil compacted by uh, bulldozers, and um, then uh, construction debris. And again, we didn't do anything to it. It was not amended. There was no irrigation system put in. We just chose plants that could tolerate hard packed clay, nutrient poor soil. And there we go, just a handful of years later. Dense, dense layered plantings. Believe it or not, one person takes care of this site uh, on a, a one day a month basis. Even in truly urban conditions, like this train station in Philadelphia, urban soils full of mercury and metals in that soil, um, salt, uh, a heat effect that is incredible from that, that asphalt parking lot, um, and all the other kinds of abuses that plants can uh, take from growing in an urban situation. And a lot of people, when this uh, project went in, really didn't think that this was going to work. They didn't understand it. They thought, you can't grow native plants here. There's not even proper native soil. But it still worked. And we did it in a, in a naturalistic way, using multi-stem trees, using different size trees, not planting them on a, in a uniform row, layering in all the material, choosing plants that can tolerate the heat island effect and the metals and the salts and the mercuries in the soil. And it uh, came out great. And it's not like these plants don't have a, a place in the wild where you can drive them from. A lot of, there has been a lot of arguing, again, that urban soils are not appropriate for native plants because there is not a uh, native analog to urban soils. But it's, again, I usually say, you know, we're not dealing with gardening on the, mo on the moon here. You know, it's we're still talking about terrestrial soil. You can find places that are similar. All you need to do is look to the serpentine barrens that are just outside Philadelphia. Serpentine barrens have an extremely high heavy metal content to them, which makes them toxic to most plants, but not to uh, many others. Um, they have an extreme uh, alkalinity to them uh, because of the nature of the uh, rock, um, just like urban soils that usually have a lot of old um, um, limestone in the soil and building material. And it's a hot site and it's all gravel and rock. There's not much soil here. Perfect place to look uh, for inspiration for uh, plants that you can use in an urban situation. Other uh, uh, examples, uh, these uh, urban uh, riverside scour grasslands, great places. This is a location that is frequently wet uh, or submerged, uh, very wet when it's wet, and very dry when it's dry, just like many urban and suburban soils. People often ask me, I've got clay. What can I grow in clay? Well, you know what clay is like? It's oxygen poor, it's nutrient poor. When it's wet, it's very wet. When it's dry, it's very dry, just like many riverside areas. So you go down to your riversides and look at what grows there. Those plants do really well in urban 
hard pink clay soils, your Joe pie weeds, all of your native grasses, many of our native perennial sunflowers. Um, in fact, a lot of the prairie species that grow in the east grow down by the, these scour grasslands, and many of them tolerate uh, these urban conditions as well as a result. Uh, lastly, uh, another thing that is important in these difficult situations is pleasing people, pleasing neighbors, pleasing spouses, uh, dealing with plants that can deal with children and pets who will all frequently run through your garden and break them down. So things that you can do to deal with this. Um, you're not going to convince anybody. Obviously, most people in this particular neighborhood are not interested in wildflower meadows. Um, and they probably look somewhat askance at uh, this person's uh, uh, meadow, even though it's a really nice, beautiful meadow right now. It's all um, Aster oblongifolius, the fragrant aster, many of our native brasses. It's a great wildlife uh, attractor. Uh, but to those people next door, it probably looks more like this, you know, abandonment. Things that you should do to avoid that, not just the choice of plants, but techniques as well. Most strips, um, not just in this case, I'm, I'm showing you actually a double mow strip. Uh, there's the lawn that's mowed here, but then someone took a string trimmer and cut everything down by half, about halfway through the season uh, on the right there, about part way into the meadow. So you actually have a layered or tiered effect. This gives this, uh, these sites the, uh, um, the sign that the place is being cared for, that this is deliberate. And signs of care, signs of intent, signs of deliberateness are important to incorporate into your landscape. Um, structure, fences, walls, gazebos, bird boxes, even signage, you know, if you think that they will read it. And plants, finally, incorporating familiar plants. Echinacea is something that people recognize as deliberate. It doesn't just look like a bunch of weeds to people. Incorporating these familiar native plants into the landscape helps soften the blow to people who might otherwise not look kindly on upon the site. Um, incorporating maybe some plants from a little further afield, southern plants like hibiscus coccinius, bright red plants. We don't have a lot of red in our ecology. Uh, in the east. The incorporation of these plants into a landscape will help ease the, uh, the, 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 the notion that, that your garden is a mess of weeds. Um, incorporation of some cultivars. I'm not an anti-cultivar person. Um, I do love uh, straight species and I love um, having straight species that have an origin story to them. Uh, an ecotype, a location origin. Um, however, uh, other than using plant these uh, those plants in restoration, I don't necessarily have a problem uh, with using cultivars under certain circumstances in settings where they're appropriate. For instance, in a garden, in a place where you might have difficulty with a neighbor or an ordinance officer or something like that, a thing like the wild Coreopsis verticillata may be a little stringy, it may be a little loose, but if you use Zagreb, it's a neater, denser, thicker plant with a great deal more firepower to it. And the incorporation of a little bit of Zagreb into your garden, uh, just as an example, uh, will go a long way to uh, making people accept the wilder parts of your garden. You know, switchgrass, the wild form is beautiful in a natural setting, but in your garden, people might look askance at it. So this is another case. You might look at a cultivar. Here's a blue one uh, looking through the gap in these trees. That's heavy metal, the Panicum virgatum heavy metal. And again, I'm just using it as an example. There are many cultivars and you may not choose to use a cultivar necessarily, but I do think it can go a long way to easing uh, neighbors, easing uh, spouses, easing um, uh, ordinance officers, that you are doing something deliberate. Native plantings don't have to be uh, informal. They don't necessarily have to be a hodgepodge of wildness. 
you can incorporate your hodgepodge into a rectilinear or a more formal uh, uh, layout. In this case here, we've actually created a, a, a false hedge out of perennials. It's a border of Baptistia australis uh, lined with um, uh, uh, purple spiderwort. Uh, and we've incorporated some grasses in it, but it's in a rectilinear form that then kind of dissolves away into the wild flower meadow beyond it. Uh, this gives the uh, site a little bit of formality to it. It creates kind of like a picture frame. It's like a picture frame for a Jackson Pollock painting, you might say. Uh, and a lot of people will accept a pile of mess if it's put in a frame. Art, of course, great to incorporate. Be seen in your garden. Make sure that you're incorporating sitting areas, but not only sitting areas, incorporate um, also, well, I meant to have the next part in this, but I guess I'll talk about this too. Um, incorporating things that you interact with in the garden that people, visitors can interact with, things that they can touch and, and pick and eat, blueberries, for example, or jewelweed. And here's the one that I'm going to go to, be seen and enjoying your garden. I worked on a lot of landscapes and I can't tell you how many landscapes I worked on where the people who were living in that house never went outside. Um, how can people uh, think that your landscape's beautiful if they don't think that you think it's beautiful? You gotta be seen out there, be out there, take pictures um, and, and engage people with it. Invasive plants, so this is the last part of tech, uh, technique before we get into talking about some actual plants. Um, choosing plants that deal with invasive plants. So there's many, many layers in dealing with invasive plants, all the way down to the nuclear option of using herbicides. Before you get to that, you can deal with uh, these plants through um, hand pulling. Before you get to hand pulling, you can deal with these plants by choosing plants that will suppress the invasive plants. Uh, here is an example where we got a mass of Japanese stilt grass around this tree. And here we've planted about half a dozen pink turtle heads uh, right in amongst that Japanese stilt grass. And all we did really is some light pulling, a little light weed uh, string trimming occasionally to favor the initial establishment of the turtle head. After just a few years, it's all turtle head. There might still probably is still Japanese stilt grass in there somewhere, but in a way it kind of doesn't matter anymore. The turtle head rules the day. The native plant has won out. And whatever little bit of uh, Japanese stilt grass is left in there is way easier to hand weed now. You don't even have to resort to uh, the nuclear option. Uh, here's an example where we did that along a creek. This was all Japanese stilt grass and garlic mustard. And after we eliminated that, we planted plugs of Senecio aureus and we sowed seed of Zizia aurea, the golden Alexanders. Two plants we knew in combination would form a massive ground cover in here. And it was so suppressing of weeds that the garlic mustard never came back. And what little did pop up was easy to deal with. Big plants deal with these kinds of things. Increase um, your aggressive plants when you're dealing with weedy situations. That's what they're there for. All right, let's talk about some plants now. Uh, I've broken this down uh, basically into three categories. Your aggressive plants, your passive plants, and your ground covers. And uh, I'm gonna run through these, let's see. Uh, we started a little after 7.30, so I guess we can go a little after 8.30. Um, some of these I already mentioned, the pink turtle head, the Chelonia lion eye here. Uh, pink turtle head, great colonizing ground cover. Aggressive, but attractive, it does what it's supposed to do. It's a good weed suppressor, a good space filler. These plants are your bigger space fillers. They're your weed control arsenal. Anemone canadensis, the Canada anemone, fast spreading, great ground cover, runs all over the place. You can grow it anywhere. It'll grow under a white pine tree. It'll grow in full sun. It'll grow in dry, it'll grow in wet. It, it grows anywhere under any situation. And it is a great, great weed suppressor. A single plant of this goes a very long way. 
Eupatorum colostinum, uh, now called conoclinium colostinum, the hardy ageratum, a blue to purplish uh, uh, meadow plant. Again, very uh, adapted to many situations, sun to shade, wet to dry. I've seen it in every one of those conditions. And I should uh, uh, reiterate, all the plants I'm gonna show you from here on in fit all the categories I talked about earlier. They're going to work in those urban soils. They're going to work uh, against um, uh, uh, the impressions of your neighbors and zoning officers. They're going to work in drought. They're going to work in clay and hard pan. They're going to work against deer. They're going to do everything that I talked about before, every one of these plants to some degree or another. The bee bombs, I love bee balm. There is a kind of bee balm for every condition. And by bee balm, I mean Monarda genus, not the species. But fistulus is a great one for full sun. Uh, there are bee balms for shade, of course, too. There's bee balms for wet and there's bee balms for dry. Monarda fistulosa is a wonderfully adaptable one and it comes in many colors. A lot of people think of Monarda fistulosa as a lavender flowered plant, but I have seen wild forms of this plant that were purple and white and bluish and pink. Um, it comes in way more different variety in the wild than just lavender. Uh, Pycnanthemum canum, that's the gray plant here. It's shown in this picture with Monarda uh, didyma, the uh, scarlet bee balm, another great one in combination. They work well together. All of the mountain mints are fabulous plants. They're equally as fabulous as all of the bee balms. And uh, they are all deserving of, of recognition. There's a like, it, just in Virginia, I think we have about half a dozen, maybe a little bit more than half a dozen different species of uh, pycnanthemum. Um, so yeah, don't just use muticum. Most people know pycnanthemum muticum, but explore it. There's lots of different species. Well, speak of the devil, there's a uh, uh, pycnanthemum muticum. This is the, the one that was out there first. This is the plant that made it okay to plant pycnanthemum. Um, it was the first mountain mint in the nursery trade and in cultivation. It's a great plant. It's often tops in the pollinator uh, uh, trials, um, but it is super aggressive. You've got to use it appropriately. Not every mountain mint is, a, as, is as aggressive as muticum, but muticum is as aggressive as its reputation uh, um, bears. Tenuifolium is slightly less aggressive, but it still is a great one for a meadow. Um, it spreads very daintily through the meadow and, and is able to hold its own. Looks great with the uh, Sclepius tuberosa. Goldenrods, I think goldenrods have become better and better accepted these days than they used to be. Most people realize they don't um, cause hay fever. Um, and a lot of studies show that goldenrods are extremely important for monarch butterflies. There was a Cornell study that suggested that uh, the presence of goldenrod, particularly along the eastern seaboard, along the coast, um, was more important than the presence of milkweed for monarch survival. So plant your goldenrods. They're really important. And there's many, many species. Although they get a bad rap also because Canada goldenrod is so invasive. But not every goldenrod, in fact, most goldenrods are nowhere near as aggressive or as invasive as the Canada goldenrod. Chesmanthium is another one that gets a bad rep, but it's very adaptable, very useful, a great weed suppressing plant, a great space filler. It gives you a lot of bang for your buck. If you buy just a few, it's going to do a lot for you. Hay scented fern, um, uh, Denstadia. This is a fern that is uh, kind of like the um, Again, it, it gets looked at a little bit askew because it's often the only thing that survives after the deer have eaten everything else in the landscape, but it still has its place. And it doesn't mean that you can't grow a lot of other things with it. In fact, a lot of woodland plants interact really well with hay scented fern. Um, oh, I don't have a picture of it. Um, for instance, most of the uh, wood asters and woodland goldenrods, white wood aster, uh, aster uh, divaricatus, and blue wood aster, aster cordifolius will, will mingle nicely with the ascented fern. Um, woody plants too, of course, um, we shouldn't forget about them. I don't want to talk about them too much because 
The woolly plants is kind of a whole nother story. The pro excuse me, the perennial layer in a landscape is where a lot of people have confusion about how to use plants uh, appropriately to, to, to cover a space. Uh, most people know how to use woody plants effectively, I think, but it is worth remembering that they can also be ground covers. A ground cover isn't just a little six inch tall evergreen plant that grows in the woods. Um, it can be a waist high shrub. It can be a 10 foot tall shrub. All it has to do is spread covered ground and prevent the growth of other plants to do its job as a ground cover. Uh, Calicanthus floridus, uh, another great one. Um, Ruses, the, the native sumacs, many different species. Here's Rus aromatica, uh, a great uh, uh, aggressive ground cover plant. Um, and even uh, the less uh, uh, well-known ones like a shining sumac. This is an incredible plant, I think. Um, really good uh, bee plant as well. Uh, and I, I highly recommend them. And I actually really love even the regular old staghorn sumac. Um, it frequently has multiple colors on it in the fall, which I think is, is uh, a beautiful effect. Um, nicer even than if it turned all red all at once. All right, the passive tough guy. Um, these are tough plants, but they don't spread. They're the anchors in the landscape. They're the plants like the Amistonia I showed you earlier. Big, dense, deep-rooted plants. They can't be pushed around. No one's going to shove them but neither are they going to mess around with anybody else. They're, they're just not like that. Agastache scrofularifolia, a little known uh, native Agastache. Um, it's a, a really tall, almost six to eight feet tall plant um, with blue flowers. Um, a really nice one for that. All of our milkweeds, uh, other than the common milkweed kind of fit into this description. Most milkweeds don't have the aggressive spreading roots. Uh, really, the common milkweed is one of the only ones that does. All the others are really dense, deeply rooted plants that don't spread around very much. Tuberosa is another familiar one. Uh, Astroblong folius has come up a couple of times in this lecture so far, and I can't sing the praises of this plant well enough. Um, the deer don't like it. It smells like walnut, the leaves do. Uh, the, the, the flowers don't have any fragrance, but the flowers are big and bold and beautiful. There's many cultivars of this plant. The straight species is just as nice. This cultivar here is October Skies, a uh, really well-known low growing one. Uh, although the plant in the wild is frequently very short anyway. Bulletproof too. In the wild, this plant frequently grows in pure gravel. Baptisia alba, the white false indigo, again, great group of plants. All of the indigos are wonderful, extremely deep rooted, very difficult uh, to be pushed around, stands up to a lot of competition. Uh, Baptisia australis, uh, the blue false indigo, that's the one that's more common. Well, it's not really not common. Uh, to be honest, in the east, none of the Baptisias are common in the wild, um, but they are common in, in the nursery trade. Um, and here, that's that same hedge I showed you earlier uh, with the Baptisia in the center and the, and the uh, purple uh, spiderwort in the foreground. Uh, Indian plantain, the Cacalia atroplusifolia, uh, another great example of a, of a, uh, of a large, tough plant. Um, the Cohoshes, Missifuga, recently classified them all as Ecteas. Uh, we actually have three species of, of Missifuga in the east. Um, Rasmosa, the black cohosh, is the uh, most well known. And uh, it's probably the tallest uh, summer blooming perennial for shade. So if you're looking for height and if you're looking for shade uh, and you're looking for summer blooming, this is uh, probably about the, the thing uh, for you to, to, to go to. Eryngium, yuccafolium, button snake root, a great plant for pollinators grow anywhere. It likes it fine in the wet. It likes it fine in the dry. It eats up clay soil like no tomorrow. Euphorbia corallata, the flowering spurge, a little known plant, but really nice. It kind of looks like baby's breath, the annual plant, uh, but native and perennial. And again, it grows in sun or shade, but very dry. It's almost always in an extremely dry place. 
Veronicastrum virginicum, Culver's root, usually in dampish soils. Here it is pictured with uh, scarlet bee balm again, another great combination. Uh, but tall, about six foot tall, indestructible, very easy to grow, grow anywhere. All of our grasses as well. Um, here's Schizocurium scoparium. All of our warm season grasses are clump forming. I can't think of a single warm season grass that's native that's not clump forming. Um, little blue stem is one of the best though. It's nice little uh, dainty grass, a lot more fine textured than the uh, common broom sedge. Um, and uh, will grow in extremely dry nutrient poor soil. Uh, Indian grass, uh, I love Indian grass. The color, the, the combination of the brown of the, uh, of the flowers with the yellow of the, um, the, the, the pollen uh, bearing parts of the flowers. Uh, it just, something about it reminds me of cream soda. I don't know the color of it. it just reminds me of a cream soda can for some reason. Uh, and I just really like it for that. Uh, prairie drop seeds, Parabolus heterolepis, probably one of the tidiest, neatest looking of our native grasses. If you want something that's got a little bit more of a refined texture for a border or an edge, then you can't do much worse than uh, prairie drop seed. And it's fragrant. It's uh, the only native grass I can think of that whose flowers actually have a scent. Um, again, it, they smell kind of like vanilla. And shrubs again. Uh, Diarvilla lanicera, the bush honeysuckle, is a great indestructible ground cover shrub. Uh, Mirica pennsylvanica, another example of a similar ground covery, a sturdy shrub. Uh, Physocarpus opulifolius, the common nine bark, uh, another favorite of mine, got popular in the nursery trade for a while, particularly the purple leaved forms. But I like the wild old uh, green uh, leaves one because the part of this plant I think is the most attractive are those seed heads, not the flowers. Uh, the flowers of nine bark are white and look rather like a viburnum. And so, you know, they're just white viburnum -y looking flowers. I mean, you've got viburnums already. The unique thing that this plant offers to my mind are these red seed pods and red seed pods against purple leaves don't show very well. I really like it against the green leaves. Uh, Sambucus canadensis, the common elderberry, a little bit overlooked in the landscape trade, but a great landscape plant. It tends to grow in wet places, but it can tolerate a lot of other situations. And it's a really good pollinator plant, and it's a really good bird plant for that matter as well. All right, ground fillers, ground covers rather. Um, these are all the low creepy things, the low stoloniferous rhizomatous plants. They're the backbone of the garden. They're the things that are going to do the actual hard work in your landscape. They're the ones that are gonna replace your mulch. They're gonna do the bulk of the weed suppression. Um, they're going to be doing all of the Band-Aid work. Uh, sedges are incredibly useful for this job. Um, a ground cover in your landscape does not have to be a broadly flowering perennial. Uh, sedges, which do have flowers and are beautiful, these are uh, Carex pennsylvanica in bloom here, um, will form a nice underlayer to any planting. Uh, and on their own even, they can make a nice mock lawn. Here it is in the spring when the plants are blooming. Here it is in the summertime. Uh, acting both as a ground cover and as a, essentially a mock lawn or, or a visual break between the different uh, planting areas in this particular garden. Green and gold, Chrysogonum virginianum, I mentioned earlier, uh, a great long blooming. It blooms off and on, almost all season long. Uh, there are multiple forms of this plant uh, in, the, in the nursery trade, different subspecies and cultivars based on those subspecies. Some of them are clumping and are tall. Others are very short in ground covery. Um, I kind of like something that's in between a good ground cover, but uh, that's a little bit taller, not too short, does the best for uh, weed suppression. Uh, our native onions, our native alliums, a great uh, asset in the landscape garden. For one thing, the bulbs, uh, not only do they d deter deer, but they deter voles and other uh, underground chewing critters. Uh, don't like the, uh, the, they don't like to have these alliums around. And you can eat yourself if you choose to. I've been told it tastes like of the dahlia. 
Columbine, Eastern Red Columbine, a great ground cover for a dry, dirt poor soil. Uh, here it is growing on a boulder, basically in moss, no soil at all. So you can see how tough the plant is, but it has to have these kinds of difficult conditions in order to do well. The reason why it frequently fails in people's gardens when it does fail is because the garden is too good for it. Lophilia ciliata, the purple wood mint, another great tough plant. Uh, I've seen it in the wild growing around here in pure gravel. Kind of looks like a miniature uh, bee balm um, uh, with these uh, purple flowers. Coreopsis, as I mentioned earlier, we have many, many species of Coreopsis. They're all fabulous. Uh, the wild threadleaf Coreopsis is a nice plant. It, it blends in and mixes really well with a lot of other plants, uh, as opposed to the Zagreb I showed you earlier that is really thick and dense and tight. Uh, the, the, the species threadleaf is very loose and open. These plants frequently, Coreopsis is, is often number two on uh, pollinator lists right after the mountain mint. For Garia virginica, I've sing, sung its praises earlier. I'll sing them again. It's a great ground cover. It's semi-evergreen. It has fruits that you can eat. Uh, the fruit is also favored by box turtles, which aren't doing so great these days. Um, and it spreads and will fill in the landscape wonderfully. Geranium maculatum, the wild geranium. Uh, another great ground cover, it grows in sun, it grows in shade. It has seeds that are spring loaded so that when they're ripe, they get thrown around, which means they can come up all over the place and, and do the ground cover thing. Uh, the lobelias, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think of them as a ground cover, but they certainly can be. Um, they can, if they're given the right opportunity, they will spread, they will seed themselves around, they'll fill them in, they'll, they'll form a nice cover, especially in disturbed soil. Many lobelias like to grow in disturbed places, particularly the scarlet one, the, the red cardinal flower. Uh, they tend to grow in places where the soil is frequently damaged and disturbed. Anothra ferticosa, I showed this picture earlier when talking about the barber's buttons, but here I'll talk about anothra. Again, it's only about a foot tall pretty aggressive plant. It blooms in uh, May and June when not a whole lot else, lot else is blooming. Um, and uh, a great one for pollinators. Bumblebees love them. And again, good low maintenance plant in my opinion. Uh, many of our native penstemons are great ground covers as well. Penstemon hirsutus is a really nice one. Again, growing only about a foot tall very tough, growing on top of a boulder here with very little soil. Senecio arius, the golden ground cell. I use this in every single project. It is a great all-purpose ground cover for wet shade, for dry shade, for wet sun, um, for every uh, conceivable situation. The deer don't like it. It fits in with a lot of other plants. It mixes well with a lot of other wildflowers. It's aggressive, but it's not that pushy when it comes right down to it. It tends to flow around perennial them out. I showed this picture in here because I couldn't decide which of these things I really wanted to talk about. Silene virginica, that's not really a ground cover, but it looks great with these other two, which are ground great ground covers. Phlox carolina is a great unsung phlox. It's a summer blooming phlox. It's only about a foot tall. It spreads, it forms a nice cover in the summertime in dry, nasty soil. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not widely available in the nursery trade, which is a shame. It really, uh, it, it really should be a workhorse plant. Uh, here it is with uh, Monarda clinopodia. I mentioned that there's a Monarda for every kind conceivable situation. And Monarda clinopodia is usually in shady places. Um, it's not quite as aggressive as some of the other Monardas, but, uh, but still, it's, it's a great ground cover, potentially. It's much shorter than a lot of the other bee balms, too. Ground cover goldenrods. We have many, many species of goldenrod that can act as a woodland goldenrod uh, or even a sun-loving goldenrod. Um, Solidago stricta, for instance, um, but also Solidago uh, flexicollis and Casea and so many others uh, will form a, a nice low ground cover. Tritus anches, this is another one people are a little bit afraid to use because of its aggressiveness and the fact that it tends to decline uh, in the summertime. 
But just like with daffodils, just like with those Virginia bluebells I showed you earlier, it's all about layering. The plant does decline, but you mix it in with stuff that grows later. What grows later than Tradescantia oleensis and then the other spiderworts? Warm season grasses, that's what. Um, little blue stem, broom sedge, Indian grass, all those things come up and will cover over the foliage of this plant after it starts to decline. And as far as it being aggressive, again, it's a ground cover. It's, it's there to do that job. It's not being aggressive. It's being useful. Uh, violets, lance leaf violet, a, len, a lot of people overlook our native violets. There are so many of them. Uh, people tend to treat them as weeds, but again, what can you better ground cover can you ask for? A tight, thick carpet of violets. They're so small, they're not going to push anything out. What are you afraid it's going to push out? Your, your little tiny, I don't even know, uh, uh, what's smaller than a violet? It's not that, you know, that um, the plants are, are, are bad. It's just that they've got a perception problem, I think. They're fabulous ground covers. They're really important ecolo in ecology. A lot of butterflies will use violets exclusively as their food source. And they're up and blooming early in the season. So they're great early forage for bees. They're really important for butterflies, particularly the fritillary butterflies. And they're beautiful, um, far more attractive than Japanese pachysander or English ivy. Zizia, along with the Senecio aureus I showed you earlier, Golden Alexanders is the other super useful ground cover for difficult, weedy, large sites where you need plants that are going to fill in fast and do a good job of suppressing the growth of an area. Zizia aurea will seed itself around. It's in the carrot family, actually, which means it's really good for black swallowtail butterflies. Uh, it's a beautiful lemon yellow, unlike the kind of orangey mustard yellow of the Senecio. So you get a kind of a two-tone effect when you combine them together. It is up early and it's able to suppress the growth in particular of garlic mustard and Japanese stilt grass. <sighs> I think that I'm done here. And since you guys were all nice enough to stay and listen, uh, this is my website where you can buy plants. And if you use that code at the checkout, you will get 10% off. Um, I will say I'm afraid because business has been really uh, uh, up this year, uh, my offerings are a bit uh, scanty this year, I'm afraid, because I've been having a hard time keeping up with demand. Uh, there's been so much demand this year. But, uh, you know, have a look, see. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great presentation with a wealth of information. We have a lot of questions. The great. first question is, do the various smelly things that are used to deter deer have any effect on pollinators or caterpillars? I don't know if anyone's ever checked. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if it did. But the thing with a lot of those things is that you don't put them out all the time. They're there now and again. Um, and I will say at my nursery, I occasionally will douse all my plants in fish emulsion. And it doesn't seem to deter anything from coming. In fact, it really invites in certain um, beneficial uh, insects. In fact, a lot of those little parasitoid wasps uh, seem to love it when I put the fish oil out on all the plants. And it really attracts uh, pollinating flies. It's uh, good to remember that pollinators aren't just butterflies and bees. Uh, in fact, taxinid flies and other flies are often uh, just as important or more important than bees and butterflies in terms of pollination. Is there a list or a resource to help with researching the different root systems? There's some good books out there. I would say that the root system of plants is not, particularly perennials and particularly native perennials has not been widely studied because until recently, nobody cared. Um, I mean, for one thing, a lot of these plants have only come into the native plant trade recently. 
So they were only of interest to ecologists in the past. And most of those studies were done on prairies. So there are a lot of books on prairie uh, um, root systems and particularly a lot of that information was extracted. And if you go to the Prairie Moon website or even the Prairie Nursery uh, website, you'll see uh, examples there uh, where they've laid out the root system patterns of a lot of the plants. Um, but I don't know of any books that are comprehensive and especially I don't know that many books about woodland plants. To be honest, in the woodland, most plants are shallow rooted. Most perennials have no interest in, in competing with trees root systems. So most woodland plants are shallow rooted. Under what conditions does oat grass spread aggressively? Uh, under what conditions does oat grass, the chasmanthium I assume is what they mean, uh, spread aggressively? It spreads aggressively under every condition. Um, I would say uh, the thing with oat grass though in the wild, and I've, I've seen a lot of places where oat grass grows in the wild, it's never as dense or as thick as it is in people's gardens. And there's always a lot of other similar size and, and aggressive plants growing with it. I frequently see obedient plant and Coreopsis pubescens growing with uh, uh, river oats. Uh, but the other thing to remember about river oats is that in the wild, they're frequently growing down along the river where the soil is stripped a bit and, and of a lower nutrient value. And there's often down trees and rocks and boulders and pits and openings and gashes and gaps. And that's another thing about people's gardens. Most people's gardens are flat, even, clean, removed of every bit of debris. debris. If there's a hole, it's been filled up. If there's a hump, it's been leveled off. If the soil's bad, it's been improved. All of that stuff gives advantage to the most aggressive plant you plant. So the key to using aggressive plants is not to do any of that stuff. Um, your, plant, your soil should be terrible if you wanna use aggressive plants. Your soil should be full of holes and rocks and fallen trees and branches. All this stuff is shelter for animals too, by the way, which we often remove those animals' homes from our gardens. Fallen logs, piles of rocks. You know, these are places for snakes and turtles and and various beetles and bees and things. Um, so yeah, that, that's often the reason why these things go crazy in your garden. Your garden's just too good. When you were discussing mulch, one person asked whether leaf mulch is better to use. Yes, leaf mulch is better, but there's not necessarily anything wrong with bark mulch. I would stay away from triple ground for the most part, and I would definitely stay away from cypress. Um, I like pine bark mulch, I like uh, pine straw, and I like shredded leaves. But again, only during the initial years of establishment. Once the, the, the landscape is established, then I do not look to mulch to do anything in the garden. The plants should be doing the work by then. What were the plants chosen for the Catskill house with little more than bedrock soil and the mansion site? The plants in the Catskill location, most of that was Phlox stolonifera, Phlox divericata, Iris cristata, then things like Heuchera, Tiarella. Um, Another of the backbone plants there was uh, Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. We use that a lot in, in those kinds of places. And uh, the other site, a lot of what was there were prairie plants actually, and shrubs. There was a lot of shrub work in that site. There was a lot of um, fragrant sumac uh, and a lot of um, native grasses and echinacea and coreopsis and rudbeckia in there and penstemons and asclepias. I mean, a lot of the prairie things. In essence, it was an or semi-organized prairie garden packed tight and interspersed with some really aggressive shrubbery. And what did you say you planted with the zizia to fight the garlic mustard? Senecio aureus, the golden ground cell. Any suggestions or recommendations 
to outcompete mugwort. You can't outcompete mugwort. Sorry. Uh, there are a handful of, of weed native of, of, of noxious weeds that you cannot outcompete. You have got to take intervention on. Mugwort, uh, the, the Chinese Lespedeza, um, the crown vetch, uh, Japanese knotweed, those things are able to undo everything. You've got to solarize them with a tarp, you've got to dig them out, or you've got to hit them with the worst kind of herbicides. One audience member comments that the native clump grasses are beautiful and asks whether there are any that do not mind part shade or deeper shade. And if so, would they tolerate red clay soil well? Yeah, all of our prairie grasses are full sun. You know, uh, they, they don't, uh, aren't, or, or were they asking for native grasses that do tolerate part yes. shade and shade? Yes. Okay, so warm season grasses mostly grow in dry, sunny places. The warm seasonality of them is an adaptation to allow them to tolerate uh, drought in particular. Um, and that's less of an issue in shady-ish places. So a lot of, the, of the, a lot of our native grasses that grow in the shade are actually cool season grasses, um, which is more like what Europe has. You know, Europe is mostly cool season dominated, but we do have native cool season grasses and those native cool season grasses are usually in the shade or at very high altitudes. Um, for warm season grasses that are somewhat shade adapted, you'd be looking at the native rye grasses for the most part, the uh, alinus. Another question about a shady area, not limited to grasses. This person is looking for a native spreader that would work well under a maple tree whose roots come up and make it difficult to mow around. Yeah, maple shade is difficult. Um, the things that I have seen, even under something as terrible as a Norway maple, have been have included um, alum root. That's a Heuchera americana, um, sedum uh, ternatum, the the native woodland sedum. You might be able to do possibly crested iris and uh, phlox dolinifera, and maybe Christmas fern. After that. Not much, and there are certain kinds of, I mean, a land, there are woodlands where the ground layer is depauperate for that reason. Another thing that, that people don't realize is that bare ground is sometimes natural in, in these ecologies. And bare ground can is an important asset to a lot of animals. Um, it's worth remembering that many of our uh, bee species require bare ground for survival. Uh, so do um, many turtles for, for laying their eggs require bare ground. Bare ground is not necessarily bad, but if you, do, if you don't like it and if you really want something to fill in, you've got to look at something that is really, really drought tolerant and small. It's usually something drought tolerant and small like that. Poverty oats might work as well if you want to go to a grass. Okay. Any comment on Virginia spider work? versus the Ohio that you mentioned? They're totally different. Um, Ohio spiderwort is a tall plant, uh, three to four, I've even seen it taller, three to four feet tall, often in moistish soil, but not always, um, and summer blooming frequently, June-ish, July-ish. Um, Virginia spiderwort seems to come in several flavors. Um, what you buy in the nursery trade could possibly be a hybrid, or if it is true, Virginia spiderwort, it, it's a little bit different than some of what I've seen as Virginia spiderwort in the mountains down where I am. I, I've seen multiple different populations and they behave differently. So Virginia spiderwort, broadly speaking, is shorter, only about a foot tall, maybe a foot and a half at most. It tends to bloom earlier than, than Ohio spiderwort by almost a full month. 
Um, and it frequently behaves almost like an ephemeral. Uh, the ones that I've seen have been completely dormant by the summertime. And in fact, that's why I was mentioning the ones in the mountains down where I am do behave much more like an ephemeral than some of the ones I've seen uh, coming out of like uh, Virginia spiderwort coming out of some of the prairie type nurseries. Seems to behave differently. Another quick question. What was the plant on your first slide? Oh, um, the plant on my first slide. It was a trillium, I believe. And that was um, uh, wake robin, the trillium um, erectum. Uh, is there a resource for telling the difference between good cultivars and some that are not advisable to use? And this no. is aware of the Mount Cuba studies. Yeah, Mount Cuba studies are good. They're, they're a good starting place. Any of the studies on cultivars and on plants, whether it's a pollinator study or a cultivar study, it's a good place to start. But it's worth remembering that what, uh, what, whether the plant is good or not is going to depend partly on where you are and what your goal is. Um, many of our cultivars, particularly the older cultivars, are not actually cultivars in the strictest sense. They're actually wild type plants that were selected for a trait and then propagated asexually over time. That doesn't really make them different from the wild plant, except that they have a particular trait that is being perpetuated. So for instance, many of the moss pink, the Phlox subulata cultivars, they're in different colors, but in the wild, they're different colors. So it's not weird to have a, a different colored cultivar. It doesn't make it somehow different than a wild plant because in the wild, the plant is not a set co a color. Um, another example would be the Aster uh, Nova Angliae, the uh, purple dome. That's an old fashioned cultivar, but nobody did anything to that plant to make it a cultivar other than propagate it asexually. The plant originally was found on the side of the road outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania. And there was a whole colony of them. They just picked the shortest one out of the colony to grow. And I've grown a lot of Aster Nova Anglia from seed, from tall plants. And every time about 30% of them are stunted or dwarfed. So I think natural dwarfism is embedded in the genes of New England Aster. It's in there. It's just that something made it favorable for that plant up in Pennsylvania to remain short. So if you grow purple dome in Pennsylvania, particularly for growing it near Allentown, you're actually growing a local wild ecotype. So whether there is a list for reference of all the plants you've mentioned and the conditions they tolerate that um, people could get. There's not a comprehensive list, at least not yet. Um, I developed the list when I was working for Larry Wiener Landscape Design, and it's still his list, which uh, they're actually using um, there for their work. Um, I do know that there is an effort going on to publish that list. Um, but to be honest, that effort to publish that list has been going on now for about 20 years. So I don't know if it'll actually happen or not. I would say that you, you you look for the cues that I gave you. The plants that work fit the characteristics I mentioned in terms of ecology, that is. If you go down to the riverside, that's a good place to look for tough plants. If you go to a barren habitat, the serpentine barrens, a shale barren, that's a good site for a tough plant. Um, if you go to a roadside, that's a good place for a tough plant. Those are the th ways that you're going to figure out what, what plants are tough if, if you want uh, to generate your own lists. And I would also say, again, these lists are variable depending on where you are. Some of these plants won't work in New England or South Carolina or Ohio, for that matter. It is a little bit site specific. Um, and I would also just like to throw in there, since it was mentioned about sites and things like that, um, I don't really do landscaping anymore. I just don't have the time. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to help and I'm happy to consult. 
but I just don't have the time to do landscape work right now or, or anything or any big consultation projects. It, it would just take up too much of my time. And I would also like to go back to the cultivar thing real quick uh, in terms of good cultivars and bad cultivars. Again, I would look, stay away from trendy cultivars, weird colored foliage, double flowers, um, dwarfy things, those things I would be skeptical of. Try to find the old fashioned cultivars. Mount Cuba has a whole list of the ones that they've put out over the last 30, 40 years. The Mount Cuba cultivars are, are mostly wild type plants that have been selected for particular traits. There is near, they're basically wild plants that are just being propagated asexually. And they're all as good as a wild plant for the most part. We have a whole lot of questions about what plants would uh, keep out or outcompete various non-native invasives. So I'll just mention, I'm gonna condense and mention a few of those if you'd like to comment. Lesser celandine, oriental bittersweet, wisteria, non-native honeysuckle. Yeah, for the most part, you can't not outcompete woody invasives. The things that you can control with native plants or selecting the right kinds of native plants are particularly the annual and biennial weeds. The Japanese stilt grass, the garlic mustard, um, cool season European grasses, various cool season European weeds, um, other annuals that, that are escaping my mind at the moment, but mostly annual, biennial weeds and, and things like that. Uh, you're not going to be able to do the work with the woody plants because the woody plants have a built-in advantage. Most invasive woody plants either have a, um, uh, an alleopathy or they are, um, uh, they, they green up in the spring uh, ahead of all of our native plants. So they get a jump on the synthesizing in the spring. If you see a lot of green in your woods in, in uh, very early in the spring, it's a good bet that those are all non-native plants. So yeah, that you have to take further interventions on woody things in particular. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. We are going to call it a night. Have a good evening. Great. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.